Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. May 22nd, 2018. The Kuna Report is powered by Kelly Financial Services. Cleaning up your financial bull. Get the peace of mind that you deserve at Kelly Financial Services. <laughs> 106 here on the great WRKO. Okay, a lot to talk about, my friends. But first, a quick reminder. Our impeach Judge Feely rally is going to be held this Thursday, a couple days from today, at the J. Michael Ruane Judicial Building. That's where Feely works. It is on Federal Street in Salem. Uh, it's going to start at about 4.15. We've got speakers that will be joining us. You can park, by the way. There's a big parking lot nearby. If you want to take the train and to avoid a lot of the traffic, rush hour traffic, it may actually be your best bet. It is the Salem stop on the commuter rail, the Rockport Newberry Port line. Uh, Brittany says it's about a five minute walk from the station to the courthouse. I'm getting people on the text machine saying it's actually more like three minutes. So whatever, three, five, seven minutes. Uh, honestly, it's all right, yeah, Brittany's got, yeah, Brittany's got small little legs, so maybe it takes her five. Uh, others, it may be three or four. And uh, honestly, um, look, we, you know, there are problems with the park and stuff like that, but there are some nice places to eat. Uh, there are some very nice parts of Salem, I'm telling you. So you can come afterwards, after the rally, you can stay, go out, get a drink or get a nice bite to eat nearby. Uh, Salem is very picturesque and, you know, parts of it. And it's not that far from Boston. It really isn't. So if you can make it, I'm urging all of you, please, 415 this Thursday. Okay, my friends. More developing now. It is drip, 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 and it is devastating. As you know, President Trump yesterday met with a Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, and FBI Director Christopher Wray in the White House. According to multiple media reports, he chewed them out. Oh, would I have loved to be a fly on that wall. And in particular, he now he just laid into both Ray and Rosenstein saying, why was he not told by his own FBI director and by his own deputy attorney general how the FBI had conducted a covert spying operation on Trump using a human spy, uh, Stefan Halper, who's now been outed to infiltrate his campaign who spied on Carter Page, spied on George Papadopoulos, spied on Trump's co-chair, Sam Clovis. He apparently was secretly recording them as he spoke with them, and he tried to sort of, you know, sort of uh, slowly make them feel comfortable uh, with Papadopoulos. He actually recruited him under false pretenses, pay, uh, giving him an all-expense-paid trip to London, hiring him to do a phony research paper on uh, energy issues in the Middle East. But the whole time, he was whining, dining him, and he wanted to see if Papadopoulos would say anything about Trump or the campaign having colluded with the Russians. It was a spying operation from the beginning. And it, in fact, took place before the FBI says it launched its investigation. So even the origins of the FBI spying are now still not known. What is even more incredible is that according to Axios, and so far they've been right on a lot, the FBI, listen to this, and the CIA, because Stephen Halper is a long-time, long-time CIA operative, He's not just a university professor. He's got deep ties to both MI6 and CIA. They were recommending him for a senior job in the administration. So after Trump won, by the way, Halper openly said he voted for Hillary Clinton. So here's a guy who can't stand Donald Trump, openly says he voted for Hillary Clinton, is a never-Trump Republican, served in three previous administrations. He's a diehard never-Trumper. Not only did they use him to spy on the Trump campaign, but then they were recommending him in a senior post in the Trump administration because they wanted to infiltrate his cabinet and his administration with spies. 
That's how determined they were to bring President Trump down. Now, listen to this. Another bombshell has just been detonated. I mentioned an individual about maybe a week or 10 days ago. He was an advisor to Trump. His name is Michael Caputo. If you remember, he is the one that has lost his home because of constantly having to go in front of these committees to answer questions about Russia collusion. He's lost his home. His family is now out on the streets. He may even lose his marriage simply because he worked on the Trump campaign. Well, yesterday, he was on the Laura Ingram show, the Ingram angle on Fox, where he openly said there were other spies and informants. Stefan Halper wasn't the only one. I know I wasn't just approached by potential informants and spies from the FBI. They were also from other agencies. And he singles out in particular James Clapper. Listen now to Michael Caputo say they wanted to push more spies into the campaign. They wanted to infiltrate the campaign with as many spies as possible. And when the truth comes out, his words, not mine, many of these people, including James Clapper, are going to be in quote-unquote orange jumpsuits. Roll it, Brittany. You, you, you've uh, spent time in Russia. Carter and I both have. In Russia, they call this the Soloviki, the national security leadership that secretly spies on the entire uh, uh, citizenry of Russia. And here we are in the United States with our own Soloviki underneath uh, uh, President Obama. Let me tell you something that I know for a fact. The, this uh, informant, this person that they planted, tried to plant into the campaign and even into the administration, if you believe Axios, He's not the only person that came at the campaign. And the FBI is not the only Obama agency that came at the campaign. I know because they came at me. And I'm looking for clearance from my attorney to reveal this to the public. This is just the beginning. And I'll tell you, when we finally find out the truth about this, Director Clapper and the rest of them are going to be wearing some orange suits. This was a covert operation, essentially a coup d'etat led by the deep state, John Brennan, I believe, was the mastermind, in collusion with Obama, Loretta Lynch, the Hillary Clinton campaign, to infiltrate, spy, and subvert the Trump campaign, his candidacy, and then afterwards his presidency. Now, he's completely right. The Remember about the liberals. Never forget this. Whatever they're accusing others is what they're guilty of. So what have they been accusing us of? or Trump, that collusion with Russia, that in bed with the Kremlin, a, a wannabe dictator looking to subvert and destroy democracy. What have we seen under Obama? Essentially, we are becoming more and more like Russia, where we have now a massive internal surveillance system from the deep state that has been spying on American citizens and now spying on rival campaigns and rival candidates. Hillary Clinton was the Putin of America. Putin in pantsuits. She intimidated the media. She rigged the media the way Putin does. She got dirt on her political opponents the way Putin does. She engaged in opposition research the way Putin does. She then weaponized the intelligence community to go after rival candidates or rival critics or dissidents. And they fear Donald Trump, and they said, we're going to break this man. We are going to infiltrate his campaign. We're going to spy on him, on his inner circle, on his advisors, and then we're going to infiltrate his administration with saboteurs. Now, you want to understand why so many people have been leaking? You want to know why? We just know about Stefan Halper. We just know about one guy how he illegally spied and was surveilling people. We don't know about all the others. As Michael Caputo said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There were other spies and other informants. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts. Hell, I will bet you the best steak dinner at the Hanover Street Shop House. Halper didn't get a senior post in the administration. Others did. This was an attempt to subvert and destroy a presidency from within. 
a coup by the deep state to ensure that Obama and Hillary retained their grip on power, even behind the scenes. The shadow government was in bed with Obama and Hillary, and now they want to drive Trump from office. That's what this is all about, my friends. We are becoming Russia. The only ones who are colluding with the Russians and imitating their tactics and their style are the Democrats, the deep state, Obama and Hillary. And now the cat is out of the bag. Coming up next, the Democrats openly admit we win back the House, we impeach. President Trump, be damned. And I'll tell you, when we finally find out the truth about this, Director Clapper and the rest of them are going to be wearing some orange suits. 120 here on the great WRKO. Okay, my friends, the scandal now with involving the CIA, the FBI, the deep state's attempt to take down President Trump is now getting bigger and bigger. Now, the Democrats fear, and they're right to fear, that their attempts to impeach President Trump is going to galvanize his base to come out big in the midterm elections. And so in the last couple of weeks, they have been downplaying talk of impeachment. It's all a lie. Everybody knows the moment the Democrats win back the House, they're going to impeach because the moonbat base, the progressives are going to demand it. They want Trump's head on a platter. Listen now to Representative Al Green from Texas, Texas Democrat, saying, forget all the BS you're hearing from Pelosi. I am telling you, we take back the House, we impeach. Roll it, Brittany. Representative Green, if Democrats take back the House in November, what is the likelihood that a Speaker Nancy Pelosi will bring up an impeachment charge? I'll let Speaker Pelosi address her actions. Um, but here is a point that I think is salient and one that ought to be uh, referenced. Every member of the House is accorded the opportunity to bring up impeachment. This is not something that the Constitution has bestowed upon leadership. It's something that every member has a right and privilege of doing. So I'm not sure that there'll be members who are going to wait for someone else if uh, that someone else, doesn't matter who it is, is uh, declining to do it. Uh, we can all do it. And I think that uh, there's a good likelihood that there will be articles of impeachment. Wait. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Because this now gets really to the crux of the issue. It really gets to the crux of the last, what is it, two years. There's no crime. I mean, I mean I, you can't just impeach for the sake of impeaching. You know, it can't just be I can't stand the guy. I disagree with him. I don't like his policies. I don't like the way he tweets. I don't like what he says on Twitter, whatever. You can't impeach for that. There has to be an underlying crime. High crimes and misdemeanors. They want to remove them. For the sake of removing them. Now, what they're saying is, and this goes now to everything. It goes to Brennan. It goes to Clapper, to Comey, to Strzok, to Page, to the spying, to everything that's been going on. To the Steele dossier, to the Russia collusion, to Mueller, to the, uh, to the Mueller investigation, all of it. They refuse to accept the results of the 2016 election. They don't want Trump in power. Period. Full stop. Elections be damned. Representative democracy be damned. The will of the people be damned. And so what you're now seeing, this to me is unprecedented in American history. I'll be honest with you. Yes, this happens in Mexico all the time. It does. In Venezuela, in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, in, in Asia. This happens all the time but not in the United States of America. And frankly, not in Canada, not in Australia, not in England, not in Western Europe. In other words, this doesn't happen in Western-style democracies. It just doesn't. Now, their refusal to accept a duly elected president, of the, in this case, of the United States. They want to overturn an election for the sake of overturning an election because they don't like the fact that the people voted in a way they didn't want them to vote. 
And so the fundamental issue here, I'm telling you, this cuts through everything. You want to understand it? Very simple. Who runs the United States of America? This is the titanic struggle that is taking place right now. Is it the Washington ruling class, the Washington establishment, the uniparty, as I call it, the Republicrats and the Democrats, or is it we the people? That's the issue. It's very simple. Who governs here? Who rules here? Who runs the country here? And what they're telling us, the message they're telling us, whether it's through Mueller, through Stephen Halper, whether it's through the FBI and, and Comey or Brennan or Clapper or whatever it is, the deep state or now impeachment is, you don't rule here. You are peasants. You work, you pay taxes, you shut up, and you do what we tell you to do. Period. Full stop. That's the issue. That is the seminal issue. Now, listen to Al Green say something else. I, I want to play it and I want to get your take. Roll it, Brittany. Uh, I have actually had, and uh, when you say what I'm about to say, people will wonder, well, who was it and uh, when did, was it said? But I've actually had a Republican member who said, you know, I'm strongly considering impeachment now. Um, and uh, I can only say to you that um, my suspicion is that there are a good many others who believe that we've reached that point in our history. But now, it's a difficult uh, bridge for some to cross. Uh, for me, it is really not about the difficulty as much as it is about the necessity to do something about an unfit president. Okay, see, first of all, I'll get to the Republican part because that's a big deal, okay? Um, look, I'm sorry. It's not for you to decide whether Trump is, quote unquote, fit for office, whether he's unfit. The voters think he is. And they elected him. And now, by the way, his approval ratings are going north. I mean, they're, 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 they're getting higher and higher. So obviously the American people still think he's fit. OK, but that's not up to you. That's what elections are for. I'm sorry, but my friends, I'm being honest, really, from the heart. This is dictatorship. This is a tyranny. This is an aristocracy. This is an oligarchy. Whatever you want to call it, that's what this is. You are deciding and you are speaking for the people of the United States. That's not your job. You don't have the right to do that. We do not live in a dictatorship. We live in a constitutional republic and a representative democracy. So the people get to decide that. Now, you can control Congress if you win the midterms. You have the power of the purse. You can block Trump, and you can defeat him in 2020. But unless he's committed a high crime or misdemeanor, a crime, the fact that you think he's unfit is irrelevant. Now, a lot of people are saying about Al Green's comments, name the Republican. Who is this Republican that you say supports your impeachment drive? We don't believe you. Give us a name. Can I be very honest with you? Al Green is many things. Okay, he's a crazy moonbat. But he's not a liar. He's not a liar. I know he's not lying on this. I don't know the specific person, but I know on Capitol Hill, I know there are some Republicans on Capitol Hill who secretly want to see President Trump impeached. I know it. There are establishment rhino Republicans who can't stand him because he is exposing them for the corrupt charlatans and poodles that they are. Let me just give you one quick example, okay? China. Over the weekend, one of the biggest stories that the media is refusing now to acknowledge is that the vice premier of China, the number two man, there's Xi who's number one, his number two came in. Trump sat down with him and got the Chinese now to agree for the first time ever that we will no longer have trade deficits with China. What essentially Trump told them was this, you're making a ton of money off of us. And we've outsourced millions of jobs, hundreds, sorry, uh, tens of thousands of factories, whole industries to you guys. You have made a ton of money, but that's over. You're going to make money. 
We're going to have a a nice trade relationship, but it's not going to be like before. You're going to have to start ending these trade deficits and these unfair trade practices. Boom. He threatened them with massive tariffs at the table, much more than steel and aluminum. And guess what? The Chinese now say they're going to buy hundreds of billions of dollars of American goods and services. So there is no longer a trade deficit. He did, in essentially one weekend, what our elites for over 30 years have told us you cannot do. Why? Because he's not beholden to the Chinese oligarchs or the Chinese banks or the China lobby. He can't be bought and paid for. And that's why he's dangerous. Because he's a patriot who will put America first. That's why they have to remove him. 617-266-6868 is the number. Okay, my friends, the summit may not take place. President Trump now says the North Korea summit, quote unquote, may not work out for June 12th. Angela Anderson is in the WRKO newsroom with all of those breaking details. What are they, Angela? 137 here on the great WRKO. Okay, my friends. Join Relay for Life and help the American Cancer Society fund cancer research, free rides to chemo, and free places to stay near hospitals. Register or donate today at RelayForLife.org. Just another quick heads up to everybody. Please join us for our Impeach Judge Feely rally. It's going to be held this Thursday, two days from today. It's going to be at the J. Michael Ruane Judicial Building. That's where Feely works on Federal Street in Salem, Mass. Starts at about 4.15. We'll have a lot of people there speaking. Uh, please, if you can come, I'm urging you, please come. It's an extremely important rally to take back our streets, our communities, and our state. Also, if you want, I advise you to avoid a lot of the traffic, if you like, take the train. It's about three, four, five minutes away, the train station stop from the actual courthouse. Take the, it's the Salem stop. You get off at the Salem stop on the commuter rail, the Rockport Newberry Port line. Okay. Listen now to Larry Tribe, Ivy League professor from Harvard, uber moonbat, uber liberal. He has a new book out. It's going everywhere. The libs are eating it up. The case now he makes for impeachment. Listen now to Larry Tribe say it's got to be the kill shot. We've got to take Trump out. We're only going to have one shot to do it. Let's make sure we do it right. Roll it, Brittany. And if the evidence that Robert Mueller is collecting forms a kind of compelling case that a overwhelming bipartisan majority of the American people find convincing that this guy is just too dangerous to keep in power, then we do have the emergency power of impeachment available. But it will be available only if we don't use it loosely and Mm -hmm. and kind of ring the bell every time uh, something looks amiss. You can't be the boy who cried wolf and expect to have a viable impeachment power. You can't use it over and over again against the same president. Right. If you're going to shoot him, you've got to shoot to kill. And that requires an overwhelming majority of a bipartisan kind. Otherwise, uh, you're just going to nick the guy and make him feel empowered and vindicated. Uh, you you got to shoot to kill. Oh, yeah. They gotta impeach the guy because he's, he's just, he's just freaking too dangerous. I don't know if I'm drunk or if I just sound like I'm drunk. But whatever it is, g- give me another. Because the libs seem to be, the moon bats are really eating this up. I'm making a lot of, <coughs> making a lot of money off of this buck. All right, 617-266-6868. What is this guy smoking? That's what I want to know. Okay, Uh, you can text us as always, WRKO, so you know it's for us. Whatever your message is, 7470-70470. This is from 
uh, 617. Jeff, impeachment is Donald J. Trump's best friend. Imagine the reality TV extravaganza he could produce in real time on live national television by putting the likes of Barry, I can't say what he really said, by putting the likes of Barry, i.e. Obama, Mrs. Clinton, Lynch, Holder, Comey, Brennan, and Clapper under oath to answer, what did you know and when did you know it? See, it's their funeral. We had Buchanan on. He made that point about two weeks ago, I think, brilliantly. If they want to go through with impeachment, go ahead. They can push their Russia narrative. But then Trump, through his people in Congress, are going to get to try the other side, which is the deep state collusion and conspiracy to spy and bring down President Trump. And then they can, uh, they can subpoena and put under oath everybody, the whole corrupt criminal gang. So if I were the Democrats, I wouldn't push impeachment if I were you. I'm just saying, because it's a minefield, and you're going to step in it, and it's going to blow you kaboom, sky high. Bill in Andover, you're up next. Thanks for holding, and welcome. Hey, El Capitano, Jeff. How Bill, are how are you, my friend? Well, it's tough out here in the trenches, but we're getting by day by day, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, first things, Jeff, I know we're doing the FBI thing in Obama, but um, good luck Thursday. I won't be able to make it, but my thoughts and prayers, and uh, I've been to your rallies, my friend, and everybody listening right now, be respectful, and the police will respect you, and just there's uh, so much force in numbers, Jeff. You know, we shut down Beacon Street that day. That was great. Yes, yes, and please, everybody, it will be. It'll be very peaceful, very civil, very respectful. It always is, Bill. You know, yes. we're not moon bats. We're not liberals. We're, we're the patriots of uh, Massachusetts and the country, Jeff. That's right. That's right. Family. You're completely right. Bill, what's on your mind, my friend? All right, Jeff. Us, uh, well, we... Anybody like me who's been following this knows this went to Obama from the beginning. It was just a culture of corruption. Uh, what was it? Van Jones got kicked off his team so early because he was so corrupt, you know? Um, but Eric Holder, if the Republicans had done it right, instead of just holding him in contempt of uh, Congress, they should have put him in jail. They have the power to do that, but they don't have the will or the guts to do it. And, you know, ever since then, everybody under Obama saw that as a green light, you know. Uh, Lerner got away with the IRS. You kidding me? Just the IRS. They were going out there with, with Gestapo teams, with guns, coming to people's businesses and everything, you know. It's been going on for a long time, but Obama, he, he you know, created and just fed this whole culture of corruption, and now all the walls are caving in. You on nailed it. I'm so glad to see it. Bill, you nailed it. Look, that's why I am so happy that Trump won the election. Think about it. If Hillary won, all of this would have gone unnoticed. All of this would continue to be going on, continue to be swept under the rug. We wouldn't even know about it. He's now outed them, all of them, out of the shadows. And say what you want about Trump, he's a fighter. He's a fighter. And so now everything, the rotten structure that Obama and his cronies built is now collapsing right upon them. And I'm telling you, my friends, the bigger, the better. Obama knew about this. There's no way none of this happened without his say so. And I'm telling you, he's going to get exposed. And I can't wait to see it happen. 149 here on the great WRKO. Okay, we're going to continue to take your calls, I promise, but I've got to ask you. Ho oh, oh, ho! Will you stop going to Starbucks? Everybody's talking about it. It is a huge story. And I got to tell you, my friends, it is a perfect analogy of what's happening, not just in the business world in America or what's happening to liberals when they take over a institution. But in fact, it's about illegal immigration and America as a whole. What, Jeff? What? what? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. What are you talking about, Jeff? Starbucks, as you know, immensely successful franchise. Basically, I'm not kidding. You can open one up on every street corner, and for some reason, they all make money. I don't understand it. I'm not a coffee drinker. 
Uh, who wants to pay seven bucks for a cup of coffee? But let that go, okay? To each his own, I believe in freedom. Uh, live and let live. Starbucks, immensely successful, very profitable. As you know, several weeks ago, there was a big incident that the mainstream media blew up into a crisis in which two African-American men walked into a Starbucks. They were not customers. They weren't there to drink the coffee, eat a muffin, or buy a bottle of water, nothing. And they wanted to use a bathroom. The manager said, well, no, it's only for paying customers. They then decided to sit down in the Starbucks and the manager's like, well, if you're not going to buy anything and you're, 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 you're basically, you're loitering, you're, you're squatting. You're, you're not a, you're not a customer. So the manager called the police and wanted them arrested. The police would not arrest them and the media blew this up into a big race issue. This is racism on the part of the manager, on the part of Starbucks. So Starbucks has now responded, listen to this, by becoming uber politically correct. And when you will start going politically correct, your business is going to start to collapse. Okay? So listen to this. It is, to me, is incredible. They've now announced a new policy. A politically correct, you can almost call it open borders. Okay? Or open, uh, open baristas. Okay? Whatever you want to call it. Anybody now can go into a Starbucks. You can use their bathroom. Whether you're a paying customer, you don't want to pay... You want to not, and not only can anybody off the street just go use the bathroom, you want to hang around at Starbucks, even though you don't buy anything. Okay. Not even, uh, like I said, a little bottle of water, something for God's sakes, a 25 cent chocolate or whatever. Nothing. You want to stay at Starbucks. You want to hang around at Starbucks. You want to squat at Starbucks. No problem. We have open borders or open cafes at Starbucks. So what do you think is happening? Now you have drug addicts who are now going into Starbucks, shooting up in the uh, in these in these cafes, shooting up in the bathrooms. They're using drugs in the bathrooms. People are just going in in and out of Starbucks. Starbucks is now becoming almost like a public bathroom. You have homeless people who are now sleeping or hanging around inside the Starbucks. It's almost like homeless camps, encampments, are now being established in Starbucks. And people are saying, well, like in California, it's better that they're sleeping inside than sleeping outside. So all of a sudden, because they've announced we're opening up our doors, open borders, doesn't matter if you're legal or illegal, let's put the, the national analogy. Anybody can come in, whether you're a customer or not a customer, whether you're invited or not invited. And now Starbucks has a huge mess on their hands. Customers are complaining. Customers are fleeing. They're saying, I don't want to go to a place that's overrun with addicts, drug dealers, uh, huge lines to use a bathroom, uh, homeless people sleeping. In fact, they're complaining about the smell. Many of these homeless people are not hygienic. They haven't showered or bathed in weeks or months. So now Starbucks facing a PR disaster and frankly, a customer nightmare now say, well, we want to be open but we don't want to become a public bathroom and we don't want homeless people sleeping in our ca in our cafes and we don't want people you know shooting up and using drugs now they don't know what to do Brittany let me ask you as a Starbucks paying customer what do you think of this new policy by Starbucks well First of all, I've definitely broken their policy before. I, I, I've run in there before to go to the bathroom um, and not bought anything before. Are you serious? <laughs> of course. At Market Street in Linfield. I'm like, where the hell are the bathrooms? <laughs> so I've run in so there you've before. Actually, so you've actually done that. I was thinking about that when we were talking. I'm like, I've actually definitely done that in Linfield before. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I got to ask you this. I got to ask you this. I have gone... 
I'm not a big Starbucks guy. Once in a while, I've gone in for the bathroom. Dunkin' Donuts, I don't like Dunkin', but sometimes I will go because I have to go to the bathroom. But I always buy something afterwards. Like, my conscience says, well, look, I've used their bathroom. I don't want to be a squatter. You know, I, I just don't. So I'll buy a Diet Coke or a bottle of water, you know, a buck or two. But I figure I use their facilities. I should pay them for something. But so you don't know, you don't practice that? No. No? Okay. All right, go ahead. <laughs> no, so uh, every now and then I do go to Starbucks. Um, I'll grab myself a shake and iced tea. I'm obsessed with those. But I think what's funny about it is I usually don't go to the one in Salem, Jeff. Really? Uh, Why not? You're a Salem gal. Why wouldn't you? Well, go- you know, I'd rather go to the one in Swampscott or in Linfield or something because, you know, there are some, we do have that problem of the homeless in Salem. So I definitely will go to my neighboring town and I will definitely get a... A shake and iced tea at the one in Swamp Scott. Hold on, Scott. so hold on. You go to the one in Swamp Scott <laughs> for the this because, reason that people are worried because about. Because there yes. aren't homeless people in that in that <laughs> Starbucks, but there is there are homeless people in the Salem Starbucks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> So, basically, you're saying you've already seen this policy in action. Yes, it's already happening. So Okay, now, what happens, though, if, you know, in Swampscott or in Linfield or you got homeless people, drug addicts, you know, people just loitering, just squatting? Are you going to avoid, are you just going to avoid Starbucks altogether? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just stick to Honeydew drive through. <laughs> Look, the thing that I do like about Starbucks, though, is they can order on your phone. So you can order on your phone, pay for it on your phone, order it, drive up, run in, grab your shake and iced tea and leave. Well, but now now I, it's now it's it. a homeless encampment. And, you know, there could be some guy shooting up. Right. You, OK, step over him. He's lying on the ground with his eyeballs behind the back of his head. You know, then you got these homeless people. They're asking you for money. You got to navigate that. It's not worth it. To me, I would just buy the beans at the Stop and Shop or the Shaw's and then just, just brew it at your own brew house. Brew it at the house. I agree. My friends, what do you make of Starbucks' new policy? My opinion, very simple. It's their business. They should, to me, if I was running their business, I'd say, you know what? Either you buy something, you don't buy something, you can't hang around here, you can't use our bathroom. Period. Our facilities are for paying customers only. What's wrong with that? Agree? Disagree? Lee, you're up next. Thanks for holding and welcome. Jeff, um, thank you. Thank you for ha- letting me speak. Go First ahead, Lee. All, I own a very small um, specialty type eatery. I have one restroom. Now, I'm going to make a couple of points here, Jeff. A woman came in. I knew her to be a homeless woman, and I allowed her when she asked if she could use the restroom. I said, yes. When you do that, you're opening a can of worms because she came back again, and she came back again, and she came back again. Um, At one point, leaving my bathroom in a disgusting condition, and I was the one who had to go in and clean. Now, these Starbucks employees, Jeff, are going to have to go in there and clean those restrooms, and then then they're going to go back, and they're going to wash their hands, but they're going to go back and make your coffee and give you your pastry or whatever. That, to me, is not acceptable. I did not want to get to the point where I put the sign on the window or on the door like they do in New York, no public restrooms, because that gives your clientele the impression that they're in a bad neighborhood. So I didn't want to do that. But I changed my policy to no one coming in to use the restroom. Now, that being said, with all the moon bats out there, Jeff, mark my words, This is going to open a can of worms that some liberal legislator is going to ask, write a bill, propose legislation that any restroom is a public restroom if somebody needs to use it. Bingo. And one thing that you may not know. Bingo. Lee, can you do me a favor? Lee, you are on a roll. I don't mean to cut you off. I am up against a hard news break. Can you hang on? I want, I'm going to come right back to you after the break. Can you hang on, Lee? Absolutely. Okay, and thank I'll make you. Another point. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let me ask you Starbucks, 
should they be opening up all of their stores or what do we call them cafes um should they be opening them up to the entire public including the homeless and drug users we're going to discuss that but first Angela Anderson is in the WRKO newsroom. She has the latest details on the breaking news stories. Take it away, Angela.